All right, so now we'll get into a little bit of a refresher on induction because it's, you know, these results that we're seeing here are probably most uh, often encountered when you learn proof by induction. So we can just refresh our memories with that here. So we're going to show that this sum of consecutive odd integers is a perfect square. We actually already did this earlier on in this lecture, of course. We did it using the fact that we know the sum of consecutive integers, and we built it off of that. But we can do the same argument here using proof by induction. So let's go ahead and do that. The way we're going to prove it is we're going to start with our base case. And our base case, so this is our statement we want to prove, that this is true for all n bigger than or equal to 1. So our base case is what happens in the case when n equals 1. Is it true? So let's go ahead and work it out. When n is 1, we get the sum from k equals 1 to 1 of 2k minus 1. That's just 2 times 1 minus 1, or 1. And that is equal to 1 squared. And so that is a true statement. So this is true for n equals 1. So now we've got a base case. Now we're going to look for our induction hypothesis. This is what we're going to assume to be true. So we will assume formula holds for n minus 1. So that means we are assuming that the sum from k equals 1 to n minus 1 to k minus 1 is equal to n minus 1 squared. So we're assuming that holds. And then the inductive step is we will show the formula holds for n, uh, for n. For n. So we're going to start with our formula for n. And we need to build in the fact that we know the induction hypothesis is true. We know that formula holds for n minus 1. So how do we do that? Well, I can write this sum as the sum of the first n minus 1 terms. And then we will add to that on the n the last term, which is 2n minus 1. And so I just split that sum into the sum of the first n terms, or n minus 1 terms, plus the final term. The sum of the first n minus 1 terms that we can use our induction hypothesis on. That is n minus 1 all squared. And then that's plus 2n minus 1. So that was by the induction hypothesis. And so this becomes n squared minus 2n plus 1 plus 2n minus 1. These cancel, these cancel, and we get n squared. And so therefore, the formula does hold for n. So formula holds for n if it holds for n minus 1. So that's how this inductive argument works. It says, let's assume it's true for n minus 1. Then it's also true for n. OK, so this is the, the way we think about an inductive argument. I like to think about it in terms of a bunch of dominoes all lined up. So we've got all these dominoes lined up. You know, this is our first one, our second one, our third one, and so on. And there's our n minus 1 domino and our n domino. And what have we just established here? Well, the base case. The statement is true for n equals 1. So that means we know that this domino is going to fall over. Thinking about this in terms of dominoes falling down. So the base case is true. Okay, so the first domino falls. What have we also shown? We've shown that if the n minus 1 domino falls, that's our induction hypothesis, let's assume the statement is true for n minus 1, or that the n minus 1 domino falls over, then that one falls and knocks down the next one. That's what the inductive step says. If it's true for n minus 1, then it's also true for n. 
And then those two bits of information tell us that all the dominoes have to fall because if the first one fell, it has to knock down the next one. And then that one has to knock down the next one. And then that one, the next one, and so on, all the way down the line until all dominoes fall. So what we've established is base case, first domino falls. Induction hypothesis and inductive step, if one falls, it knocks down the next one. And therefore, all of them have to fall down. And so that's our conclusion. So therefore, by induction, the statement is true. The formula is true for all n greater than or equal to 1. And so we've done our proof by induction of that summation formula. All right, so that, again, was just a, a review of induction. Induction is going to be a, a proof technique that comes up quite a bit when we get into graph theory. And so it's to, today is a perfect time to review this, review the inductive approach. We have used it in um, some prior um, topics in this course. I didn't do a full review then, um, but now I th thought it might be the appropriate time to do a full review of induction just because of the relationship with the summation operator that we're seeing. All right, so I'll leave this one for you show that the sum of consecutive squares is given by this formula by induction. Again, the key is by induction here because we have just proved it using generating functions. So we've actually proved that the sum of consecutive squares is equal to this through generating functions. And the nice thing about that approach is we didn't even need to know the formula in advance. We started with this and we were able to generate what the formula had to be. Whereas when you try to do a proof by induction, you need to know what the result is in order to prove it. So we need to know that this is the formula we're trying to prove in order to use induction. Whereas the generating function approach didn't require us knowing what the formula was in advance. We actually produced it. Um, but again, just for extra practice, try proving that result that we've already established now, but using induction to prove it. Here's another example of induction. So let's show that every integer n greater than or equal to 2 can be factored into a product of primes. So what do we want to show? We want to show every integer bigger than or equal to 2 can be factored into a product of primes. So for example, you know, we've got like 8. 8 can be factored as 2 times 2 times 2. That's a product of primes. What about 12? That can be factored as 2 squared times 3. What about 11? Well, that's just 11. So we can think of that as the product of just one prime. So we want to prove that every integer that's bigger than or equal to 2 can be factored into a product of primes. And so we'll use induction to prove this. So proof by induction. Again, just a recap or a review of proofs by induction, just so we refresh our memories. So we need to start with the base case. So our statement is up here. Every integer n bigger than or equal to 2 can be factored into a product of primes. That's the statement we want to prove. Base case, n equals 2. Well, 2 is just equal to 2, and that's a product of just one prime. So the result is true. The result is true for n equals 2. Now we've got our induction hypothesis. What is our induction hypothesis? It is assume the result is true for all integers less than or equal to some, let's say, some value k. And then we want to prove it's true for k plus 1. So we're going to assume the result is true for all value, all integers. I'm going to make it a little bit simple. I'm just going to simpler. I'm going to just say strictly less than k. That way I don't have to add a plus 1 in, in the rest of my argument. So what I'm doing is I'm assuming that the result is true for all smaller values of an integer. And then 
show that it must be true for that integer k. This is known as strong induction. Because I'm assuming the result is true for all, I mean, in terms of our dominoes diagram from before, I'm not assuming it's just true for one value and showing it's true for the next one. I'm saying assume it's true for all values smaller than some particular value then it must hold for the next value. That's the strong induction part. Assume it's true for all values smaller than k, and then use that to prove it's true for k. So there's our induction hypothesis. We'll do our inductive step. OK, so we want to show, want to show true for k. Well k is some integer, and I want to prove it's true that k can be factored into a product of primes. So we have two cases. Case 1, if k is a prime, then, much like in the case where we consider you know, 11 or 2, if k is a prime, then it can be factored into a product of primes. Namely, it can be factored into the product of just, well, one prime. Um, so then k equals k, <laughs> that's sort of a trivial statement, is a factorization of k into one prime itself. So it's true. So statement is true. What about case two? Well, if k is not prime, then it is composite. And that just means that we can write it. k is some, let's say, m times n for integers m and n, which are both strictly less than k. So we can factor it into the product of two integers, which are both strictly less than k. Each of m and n are therefore products of primes. Why is that? Well, that's our induction hypothesis. Our induction hypothesis says that for integers that are smaller than k, we can write it as a product of primes. So each of m and n is a product of primes. And so therefore, k is a product of primes. We just use the product that we've used for m and multiply that to the product that was used for n, and we get a product of primes that produces k. And so that means then that um, the result is true for k. So assume the result is true for integers less than k. Now the result is true for k. And therefore, I'll put that out here, therefore, by induction, the result holds for all n. And so there is the end of our argument. It holds for all integers bigger than or equal to 2. So again, just a refresher of the proof technique of induction. The main object of this section, though, was the summation operator. But we could see how that produced some summation formulas that we had seen before in, um, for example, proofs by induction. And so we just wanted to revisit proof by induction at this case. Uh, I'll leave you with the final exercise here that you can think about. Uh, if alpha is 1 plus root 5 over 2, and fn is the nth Fibonacci number, then prove a certain result of relating fn and fn minus 1 and prove it using induction. So another opportunity to practice proof by induction. All right, that's it for this section. Thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you again next time.